Joining us now on the Megacast is an assistant professor of management at Oakland University's School of Business Administration. Michael Greiner joins us once again to talk about all things business and, fin and finances on today's Megacast. Michael, thanks for being with us. Glad to be here, Tyler. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good to have you on with us. And we start off with what seems like pretty good news. The U.S. dollar uh, is currently doing pretty well in comparison to some other currencies across the world. So on the surface, when you hear that, when you see a, a headline from a, an, article, an outlet like the New York Times that says the dollar is strong, you think that might be really good news for us here in the U.S., but comparing with other world economies where their currencies uh, aren't really comparing very well, to the U.S. dollar, what does that mean for the state of the U.S. dollar? Well, it is it is good news. You're right about uh, the U.S. economy in particular and kind of for all of us living here in the United States, you know, because of the fact that with a stronger dollar, it makes it cheaper for us to buy goods that we import from overseas. So as a result of that, this is actually something that's been somewhat reducing the pressures of inflation, the fact that the dollar is so strong. The problem is that we're living in an extremely integrated economy throughout the world right now. And if things get really bad, say in China or in Japan or in Europe, then that can come back and affect us here in the United States as well. And as it turns out, the strength of the dollar is reflected in relationship to those currencies overseas. So things like the uh, Chinese yuan or the uh, Japanese yen or the euro or the uh, or the British pound are all way down compared to the dollar. And that's pretty unusual for there to be such a drop because of the fact that you, you will see this a lot of the time with, say, less developed countries. But we're talking about rich countries here that are absolutely getting clobbered by the dollar. Now, there are a number of reasons that uh, the dollar is so strong. Um, and if I could just take a step back for one second, just to give a little bit of background as to how we determine the value of currencies, it comes down to, like anything else, there's a market for it, uh, a global market. And what happens is, as countries will trade with each other, so say we go and buy a bunch of stuff from China, well, what will happen as a result of that then is China will have a bunch of dollars. And what they want to do then is convert that into uh, the Chinese currency. Well, because of the fact that then they're selling dollars um, and buying uh, the Chinese currency, well, that will drive up the value of the Chinese currency then. So um, typically, typically uh, having a um, having a strong economy uh, is reflective of having a strong currency. And that gets complicated. I mean, that gets complicated a little bit more because the fact that you'd think, given the fact that we do have these trade deficits with China, with Canada, et cetera, that as a result of that, the dollar wouldn't be doing so well. But it is doing well. And, and that brings us then to the next phase of this analysis, which is investment money. And where do investors want to put their money? Well, right now they want to put it in the United States, basically for two reasons. One is that the Fed is dramatically increasing interest rates. And what that means is putting your money in the United States means you're probably going to get a higher rate of return here. Uh, so they want to buy things like treasury bonds. They want to buy bonds that are denominated in dollars. They want to uh, invest in assets here in the United States because of the fact that the higher interest rates are going to make those things more valuable. The second thing is that the there there's a lot of chaos going around in the world. As we know, there's this war going on in Ukraine. There's all kinds of uh, unusual activity going on in the economy in China, for example. Um, the Europe looks like they're about to go into a major recession as a result of the energy crisis. And so as a result of that, again, investors are looking for a safe place to put their money. And the safest place historically to put your money is in dollars. Um, so as a result of that, there's huge demand for dollars right now in the global markets. People are trying to get rid of these other currencies that drives down the value of these currencies and it makes the, uh, the dollar more expensive. So again, good news for us, right? Uh, but again, when you look at it within the context of us having this global uh, economy, if things aren't going well, say in uh, in Britain or in Europe, or for that matter, in Latin America, 
then those problems can sometimes creep over and affect us here in the United States. So it's a kind of a delicate balancing act that we want. We don't, we want to have a strong dollar. And the traditional policy here in the United States is what we call defending the dollar, where we try to make sure that it stays as high as possible. But by the same token, what that does is it, it risks potentially throwing, say, uh, certain less developed countries into defaulting on their foreign debts. Because you have to remember, most debts are denominated in dollars. Um, most trade is in dollars. So as a result of that, a lot of countries around the world now are facing food insecurity because they're trying to buy uh, imported food and that food is denominated in dollars. And if, the, and if their currency is worth less relative to the dollars, it makes it more expensive for them to buy that food. Um, so suddenly we're facing a problem where you could be dealing with uh, hunger around the world. You could be dealing with, um, uh, with debt defaults around the world. And these are all things that the United States is going to want to step in and address because if you have uh, some type of insecurity somewhere in the world, then that threatens kind of the global order of which the United States is a part. And that's where we have repeatedly stepped in and tried to avoid, say, a Latin American debt default or tried to avoid, you know, some major, uh, um, uh, you know, a government essentially uh, falling apart because of uh, food insecurity among its, uh, among its population. Just to give you a sense of how dramatic the, the, uh, um, the rise in the dollar is, though, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, um, the British pound was about three pounds to the dollar. People used to talk about how expensive it was to go to, to England for a vacation. When, then about 20 years ago, um, when I was in my 30s, um, I took my family to England for a vacation. And I remember my wife talking about the fact that you could pretty much, it, it seemed like things were priced the same um, as they are in the United States. So like if, if a sandwich here were $1, it'd be one pound in England. The difference is that a pound was twice as expensive as a dollar. So essentially, then it went from being three to one to two to one. Now the British pound is one to one. Um, and it really uh, just shows how dramatically uh, the dollar has appreciated in value around the world. And this is true. We're seeing this across the world where other countries are for very in various ways trying to struggle with the fact that literally their economy is being hurt by the fact that the dollar is so strong. Michael, also making headlines recently here in the U.S. Uh, on the business side of things, the Justice Department is is currently looking into suing the, uh, the two airlines, American Airlines and JetBlue, for essentially forming their own little alliance, particularly in the New York City area and in that airspace, airspace region. Uh, the claims is that the, these two companies, by uh, creating this partnership in that area, are violating antitrust laws. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't other competitors in the New York area that are just as large of an airline as American Airlines or just as large of an airline as American and JetBlue combined. So from the Justice Department's perspective, what are their problems with this pr uh, proposed partnership between American and JetBlue? And just how does that violate antitrust laws? Yeah, you raise a great point here, and uh, I think it's worth noting the fact that uh, New the New York area and part of the arguments that American and JetBlue are using for their alliance is the fact that United Airlines has a huge hub at Newark, which is one of the three New York airports. Delta has a huge hub basically spread between the other two New York airports, uh, JFK and LaGuardia. So as a result of that, you've got these uh, two airlines with huge operations there, and American and JetBlue are arguing, well, they want to kind of come together so that they're able to compete on an equal footing. And the biggest area of comp of issue is apparently the New York to Boston market, um, which uh, uh, is dominated by Delta, uh, because Delta has, again, a hub both at the two of the New York airports and in Boston. Um, JetBlue has a hub in Boston, and American also has a pretty large operation in Boston. So the concern is, is that you'd literally be going from uh, three large airlines in Boston down to two. Um, now, the broader issue, though, that we see here is that over, say, the past 30 years or so, the courts have basically been whittling away at antitrust law. Uh, most of us remember from school learning about the Sherman Antitrust Act, which was passed, but, you know, basically around the turn of the century under the administration of uh, uh, President Theodore Roosevelt. 
And the reason it was passed is that you had these huge robber barons, as they called them, you know, basically who had consolidated different industries together and created these trusts. And they wanted to break them up because these trusts were, were making it a situation where they had monopoly power. They were able to increase the prices without fear that competition was going to come in and undercut their price and take away customers from them because they had so much market power. So traditionally, the way then that, that courts have interpreted this is that they've looked at it as you need to show to prove an antitrust case, you need to show that consumers will be harmed by it, that there's some lack of competition that will result in prices going up or in uh, less choices being available to consumers. And um, what's more is there's nothing wrong with a company just becoming big on its own. Where, the, where, where courts and the government have a problem under antitrust law is if a company will either try to buy a competitor to reduce competition or they will use their strength in a different market to try to essentially dominate a, a, another industry. Let me give you an example of that. Many of us are familiar about the case against Microsoft a number of years ago that actually was basically successful. Ultimately, Microsoft settled. They end up uh, getting rid of some assets, changing the way that they did business in certain ways, uh, and end up having to pay some fines as a result of it. Well, the basis for that lawsuit was that at the time, Microsoft had essentially a monopoly uh, on the uh, the desktop systems that were out there, you know, with Windows, you know, all of us know about Windows. And at the time, Windows had, I think, more than a 90% market share of desktop computers. So they were really dominant. Um, and uh, the And at the time, uh, Microsoft had kind of miscalculated the impact that the internet was going to have on computing. Um, and all of a sudden they realized, oh my gosh, this could be really big. And they suddenly wanted to turn, turn things around. Well, at the time, the browser that was preferred was this browser called Netscape Navigator. Some of us may remember, some of us may have even used it. Um, but uh, what Microsoft did is given the fact that pretty much everybody had on their computer a, a, a Windows desktop, they automatically put on there their browser, Internet Explorer, making it much easier to get than having to send away for the disks. We remember that we have to, had to send away for like these uh, CD-ROMs and put them in our computer to be able to get Netscape Navigator. So that put Netscape at a real disadvantage and uh, and basically resulted in Windows ultimately driving Netscape out of out of uh, out of the business. I assume that, like most people here, there isn't anybody out there using Netscape Navigator right now. Um, so, you know, so it shows. So that type of behavior is 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 uh, is a problematic to the government. So right now, the government though is trying to kind of shift gears where the government has kind of put these restrictions where you have to show that there's this um, anti-competitive effect that's going to hurt consumers before they will step in and do something. And the government is arguing, look, you know, there aside from the direct impact on consumers, there's been a lot of consolidation across American business overall. And that's true in any industry. You can see where uh, just business has become much more consolidated. There are fewer competitors. And the irony is, in many cases, it hasn't really hurt consumers. In fact, in some cases, consumers have benefited. Look at Amazon. You know, I am a, I, by, by way of full disclosure, I am an avid user of Amazon.com, as I think most people are out there. It, they provide a great service. They provide great prices. Um, so why am I going to complain about Amazon being big and becoming so dominant in the industry? But who it has hurt is it's hurt its suppliers, where Amazon's strength in that market has created a situation where they're basically able to dictate terms to, say, publishers or to people who are trying to sell products through their uh, through their operation. And they've been able to kind of close out certain industries to other kinds of uh, uh, competitors, like, say, uh, the e-readers. You know, you don't see many e-readers out there other than Kindles right now. And so the concern that the administration now is saying is that even if, even if there isn't necessarily a big impact on consumers, just the fact that they're big is something that we should worry about. And the, the sense is that this case is, is essentially a test case for that, where it's going to be hard for the administration to show that, oh, there's this direct impact from this alliance between JetBlue and American on consumers because of the fact that you do have Delta and United with their big operations in New York already. But uh, um, but the fact that they are keep getting bigger and these airlines keep consolidating and there's less and less competition out there. I mean, many of us here in the Detroit area remember Northwest Airlines. What happened to them? Well, they consolidated with one of the other airlines, you know. Um, so 
there's this declining amount of competition overall. And the administration basically wants to have a test case where they say, okay, being big in and of itself is a problem. Having an industry that's consolidated in and of itself is a problem, and we shouldn't have to prove specifically that there's some harm that comes to the consumers as a result of this, because overall it's bad for the economy. According to an August uh, an August article from Taylor Raines at Business Insider, JetBlue, number 13, largest airline out of 20, uh, out of their top 20 in the world, number two is American Airlines. United is at six, Delta at number three. Michael Greiner from Oakland University joins us on today's edition of the Megacast. Michael, a couple more minutes with you. Uh, yep. today. Uh, I want to go over this before we let you go. An Indiana legal group is challenging the Biden administration uh, to attempt to block its new student loan debt relief plan. Where is that uh, at, at as it currently stands? And what is the basis that this group in Indiana is putting behind challenging this uh, this front from the Biden administration? Yeah, I'm glad you bring that up. And actually, today we just got news that there is another lawsuit that's been filed. And this one has been filed by the attorneys general of, I believe, six states um, against the administration. And basically, the argument is that Congress, according to the Constitution, has power to, for, to allocate money. Um, and the fact that the administration is stepping in and doing this is something above and beyond what Congress has authorized in terms of its spending. Now, the argument that the Biden administration has made is that there was legislation passed by Congress that specifically says that in the case of a health emergency like COVID that we've been dealing with, that the administration has the power to step in and take certain steps like this and cancel certain kinds of debts. And in fact, they had done it before, where uh, there were veterans um, who had certain student loans. And given the fact that uh, um, that some of them were deployed, this was a number of years ago, um, during the uh, uh, the Afghanistan war, for example, and the, and the Iraq war, um, that uh, as a result of them being deployed, they weren't in a good situation to be able to pay off these student loans. And so the administration stepped in and canceled some of them. Now, the Biden administration is arguing that they're using that authority um, to be able to move forward with this. Now, the arguments are, oh, they, they're, they've really overstepped their authority. That's all an issue for the courts to sort out. Um, the biggest issue with both these cases, though, is what's called standing. And what standing is, is that to be able to file a lawsuit, you have to be specifically harmed. You know, you can't just go ahead and file a lawsuit because, you know, oh, you're mad at your neighbor for something. No, they have to have done something to you that has harmed you in a way that the courts can redress it. You know, courts don't like to, you know, talk about theoretical issues. They want to, they want to step into what they call actual cases and controversies, where there's really something that is an issue between the two parties that they can resolve. So in the case of this, uh, um, this Indiana legal group, um, which, as I understand, uh, is actually has the backing of, uh, of some billionaires, some might be familiar with the Koch brothers, um, apparently they're kind of backers of that group, um, but one of their attorneys actually is the plaintiff in that case. And what he's arguing is that uh, he currently receives uh, certain the, the potential for uh, certain of his student loans being um, forgiven because of the fact that he receives the benefit under a special income-based repayment plan uh, for people who've gone into public service of some kind. So as a result of that, he's saying that if he does this for a certain number of years, whatever remains on his debt would be forgiven and he would not have to pay taxes on that. Indiana, though, is a state that has said that it's possible that people who actually receive this um, this uh, debt forgiveness would uh, be treated as if they had received income. And that's frequently a case when debt gets forgiven, it gets treated as income. And so the argument is that because of the fact that right now he wouldn't have to pay income taxes on any debt forgiveness, and this plan would make him uh, have, uh, have debt forgiveness, that or, or would make him pay taxes on it, that as a result of that, he's been harmed. Now, I got to tell you, I think that's a weak argument, in large part because of the fact that the administration, number one, hasn't really announced all the details of the plan. But from everything I've seen, it's going to be voluntary. So if he thinks that he's in a better plan where he's at now, he just stays there. And that kind of destroys the legal arguments that he's, uh, uh, that he's made. 
The attorneys general, though, have a little bit of a bigger issue where they can argue that somehow their state has been harmed, that there might be state funds that might have come to the state uh, as a result of the fact that the that Congress had made certain allocation decisions, which can't happen now because of this debt forgiveness. Frankly, I believe the attorneys general might have a stronger arguments than the uh, than this legal group. But again, you never know with courts. We'll just have to see how these things proceed. Well, Michael, appreciate your time. Thanks for uh, giving us some insight on some of these very important and very intricate issues. Happy to be here. Thanks a lot, Tyler. Have a great weekend.